This week on Hermitcraft. Kiralis has been standing here completely still. He's, he's even got AFK. Just, just staring. Staring at Bumbo Jumbo Night. <laughs> Welcome to the Hermitcraft Recap! My name is Pixorifs, our writer is Loy XP, and by the time this recap releases, we will know what Mojang has planned for the big update, which may have the potential to fundamentally change Hermitcraft as we know it, or it may just bring glowier snow and snowier squids. Either way, it'll have to be a pretty big update to generate more hype than decked out. And with that out of the way, and us surely eating our words on Sunday morning, let's take a look at all the events and mishaps that occurred on the Hermitcraft server this week. Please close your mouth. Starting with ZF, whose idea of fun is developing piston extenders from scratch, or rather an entire piston door. Here goes, three, two, one, whack. Oh. It is more of a trap door, or maybe a skylight, which is where the entertainment would end if Zed didn't decide to use target blocks as a doorbell. Anyone want to prove their skills with bow and arrow? Poised. No touching the ground. From here, getting to his lair by shooting the target midair became a whole minigame in itself, one that claimed many a Tango and Grian. <laughs> At this point, most of Tango Tech's time is dedicated to crafting more compasses, since Decked Out took off and took out half of the server's playtime. Despite this, Tango finds time to put together a ghast tier farm powered by a soul sand valley and occasional wither roses, and comes up with plenty of things to add to the dungeon while he's at it. The new mechanics hermits will enjoy getting decked by are a ravager pet system, challenge compass eye, and a roulette carpet at a particular corner of the maze. That one's pretty self-explanatory, you just have to guess which square to throw your compass at to win a prize or not win a prize. Three clues will be hidden within the dungeon to guide you. Find them all. So The challenge compasses are multi-destination pointers, sending you on a trail across the whole maze until you finally get your supercharged loot box. And the Ravager pet system allows you to rename one of the decked out Ravagers and receive an extra dungeon key every time it kills someone. Looking forward to someone buffing one with potions right before somebody else's run. So Corrales is all about that decked, naturally, even if he doesn't make it to the gambling carpet. It's pretty clear that hasn't been installed yet anyway. Still, Corrales gives the Ravagers a few runs for their, I suppose, dinner, which provides them with a whole lot of entertainment and us with plenty of quality Corrales noises and sound bites. As per usual with this minigame, the deck most built is actually our soundboard. How could I do that? How could I get down? Oh. Oh no. Oh, that's adorable. Oh, Morales, oh, hey. An interesting way of dominating Decked Out occurs to Cub Fan, who decides to not just run around the maze scraping at surroundings for extra loot. Being one of the earliest players, he is long in the trading stage of the game, and pulls off quite a few impressive exchanges with people. False Symmetry, for one, had to surrender a unique from the B set as a result of an agreement with him, which might just be the next set he'll be eyeballing now that he's completed Ocean and Witch sets through trading with Impulse, Joe, and Zeta. Cub even scores the remaining road pass money by selling Azuma a dungeon key he snatched from his AFK body with Impulse. I've been trying to do a good deed of the day every episode, and I forgot the last couple episodes, so my good deed of the day is... he saw nothing. Go ahead, Cub. Uh, okay. It's all yours. Okay, I'm going for it. I'm going for it. It's been pressed. It's been pressed. Mm, it's cool, man. I've got so many of them, I'm not bothered. But it, it sounds like there's a way for me to help you. You know, I've had some bad luck. Yeah, maybe your luck's about to change, you know? It's good luck key, you know? This trade allows the entire commercial district to dodge a bullet, actually. I'm sure you were wondering what the giant eyes of Ender in the sky over it were, and well, it's still unclear. Cub put them up originally as surveillance over every shop that didn't pay up for trope connections, and he promised great penance for them. But then Azuma bailed the whole economy out, and Cub happily took down the entire thing. All we know is Cub is pretty brutal, what with his dunk you into a box with a Vindicator minigame, so we really lucked out on this one. Having held a subscriber vote to return to the Bizuma skin, Azuma Void promptly abandons it for a Ravager-inspired one. It doesn't help against other Ravagers, but he looks fashionable, at least. There's one literally there! I don't know if I should try and go- Oh, okay, it's seeing me. <laughs> it is certainly the laundry week for him anyway, as we see him swap outfit to outfit, farming his own head for decorations on the side of his commercial area road. 
populating the land with armor stand spacemen and spaceman accessories. Azuma even reaches the decked out entrance with his terraforming, though that wouldn't look as good with moon terrain around it, unfortunately. As for the game he's been making, Lucky 13 is done and dusted and tested on the best hermits that were available at the time. Now a veteran of decked out, Hypno is invited to test out the L13 minigame with Cubfan. They win at utilizing Cub's extensive knowledge of target blocks, but mostly the ability to shoot at them. Dang! That was, Dang. A, that was such a hard shot! Oh, that was tough, that the final shot. Drop. Oh, the that honey drop. Oh, that was awful. The honey drop was nuts. <laughs> I hit the target once or twice, but it wasn't I close enough. Don't think oh, I even man. hit the Blackstone. <laughs> At his home base, Hypno expands the aquarium trinket shop into a full-on oceanarium with a dolphin tank that doesn't have any dolphins in it, or a squid tank that doesn't have any squid in it, whichever will be easier to wrangle in. But speaking as someone who's tried both, it's better off just being a tank. iJevin decides to jump right into the mycelium resistance, but not literally yet, because he can't find the entrance. Never mind that, he's with the Rebellion in spirit, and that's all that matters, as long as he has a mycelium farm of his own, and pile upon pile of materials free of charge for any new recruits. Anyone willing to join the fight for the cause, whatever that may be, can grab a gift bag on the mycelium patch by his pineapple shop. A shop shaped like a pineapple, that is. He's selling sponges from it. Now here's the thing, right? Everybody is allowed to uh, take these items, and they should probably leave some for the other hermits, but... The people that are not allowed to buy them or touch them at all, Cub, Scar, BWO, and anybody else associated with the non-mycelium resistance, we're not even allowed to talk about it. So, yeah, everybody but them. The Mushroom Liberation Front actually has a full emergency meeting this week, unaware that there is one imposter among them. Two, if you count XP crafted made of sticks. Deciding on a whole lot of things, they also agree to establish a secondary secret base even more secret than the secret one. Which wouldn't take much, mind you, but there's a promise of secret doors and whatnot, so this is all very exciting. So, since we're all like a, a gang now and we all know why we're here and what we're doing, then I think what we should do is take another location and make it our base and never show the entrance on camera. That way, okay. smart. we can have yes. a proper... Yeah, it's getting kind of funky down here too. I, I'd prefer if we moved out, to be honest. To strengthen his alliance with Etho, Grian lets him upgrade the gold farm at the Upside Down, and to strengthen his alliance with Rendog, Grian signs with him on winning the Hedge Games Pact, which comes real easy to them when backed up by a pile of leafy shulker boxes. So now, I want to lead him without saying a word. We want to lead him. We want to... Oh, no, not the whole pile. Teaming up does sound like a plan, actually. If, if you come this way... Oh. I might be able to, uh... <laughs> Using my own trick oh, oh, no. <laughs> Etho's additions to the Upside Down are a right way up piglin bartering system and some item storage cells for everything pig kind can produce, whether zombified or not. Back in the overworld, his second attempt at Decked Out ends with skeletons using him as arrow storage, but then he goes on a winning streak anyone would be proud of. Perhaps his greatest achievement, though, is beating B-dubs to Skipping the Night. <laughs> No, 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 come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh, I did it! Yes! It isn't the only challenge Etho throws at B-dubs, although the other one is to build the entrance to the gaming district. And along with landscaping around his castle in progress, B-dubs' contributions to the Upside Down continue, with the added complication that he's now fitting the interior around all the new redstone. Meeting up with Mayor Scar, the two of them make plans to build more shops, but then sell the business premises to the Hermits to maintain, which B-dubs gets the ball rolling on, opening a concrete shop with a built-in concrete converter, which works just fine, thank you. They also discuss the defacement of the shopping district, and then the facement of the shopping district, considering adding more Hermit heads to the custom-built cliffside. But considering the amount of player masks freely available on the server, all the heads might end up being B-dubs. Now we're currently in the process of slowly creeping down the stairs and, um... <laughs> stalking... Tango? The look at this! Vintage Beef also discovers the defacing of his facing, and honestly we're just enjoying getting to make the same joke twice. Beautiful artwork with mustaches? I never would have guessed that would happen. To balance this unsightly visage confronting him at the community billboard, he decides to make the shopping district a little prettier, along with Wells Knight. I mean, Wells Knight is already pretty enough. The roads. They build the roads. The rest of Beef's week is spent diving into Decked Out, helping Azuma playtest L13, and bidding on goods at the auction house. Look at this. Stuff is getting intense. 
Uh, let's see, the coveted original 12 Bamboo. Who has won this one? The winner of this one is, looks like Ito, with THE stick. Not a stick, THE stick. Impulse also bids high on basically every auction he can get his hands on, confident that he'll win back some of his money thanks to the proceedings going to the road designers. After setting a new high score with the revised rules of Chicken, he trades decked out artifacts with Cubfan and helps him snipe a dungeon key out from Azuma's nose, then balances the karma out by helping Rendog find one of Tango's hidden shulker boxes. But the Ravager cares not for karma, good or bad, leaving Impulse to deftly dodge it as he runs the dungeon himself. We're definitely in the part of the dungeon here that leads to the exit, which is... Yes, right here. Okay, we're going to make it out intact with our loot token. Perfect. Ah, oh, that wasn't a bad run at all. XB Crafted's return to Decked Out focuses more on exploring the dungeon and scoping out its secrets, although he finds most of the barrels empty thanks to a lack of loot finder. Opting to amend for his past mistakes, he returns to Cubfan's target minigames to correct his slightly cheaty 25 scores, although perhaps because of server lag or some other redstone malfunction, the game itself isn't exactly playing fair. Perhaps it's somehow sensed that he joined the Mycelium Resistance earlier that day. Uh, I mean, it doesn't say anything about not showing anything or anything like that. I mean, I don't, I don't know what all of this has been shown. Hopefully it's not a spoiler. I would imagine it's not because... You know, people kept telling me during streams to buy mycelium, so... Joe Hills has been trading his way to decked out success, tracking down a few dungeon keys and combining cards, then swapping artifacts with Cubfan just to make room on his board. Going all in on the deck building seems to be Joe's strategy, and we'll see if it pays off to play the game how Tango intended. We still have three tiers of Soul Seeker, two and five tiers of Beast Sense. Hopefully giving up that stealth doesn't hurt me too bad. But I, I can't tell how much stealth has helped me at all so far. So, you know, it's hard to say. Stress Monster manages to get one past Tango, being so enthusiastic about upgrading her diamond armor to netherite that she forgets to take it off before stepping into the dungeon. Incredibly, it doesn't actually help all that much. Ha! Oh, oh, ha! Dodge and weave! Dodge and weave! Is it up here? Dodge and weave! And the attempts without armor actually go much better for Stress, who manages to discover and buy enough keys to fit five dramatic decked out runs into a single episode. Three decked out coins! Ooh, hi Tango! Oh, that's so cute! Oh, look at that! Okay, yeah, no, this, this, oh, that is so cute though! Some people go into the dungeon looking for loot, others embark on this quest simply to find themselves. Oh my goodness! Hello, hello! What, what are you... Having claimed the purple road in the shopping district, Iskal adopts a traditional stone style for the road, hoping to win originality points by evoking Minecraft's aesthetic origins. But the simple design hides a complex network of rails, on which several villagers ride around, dispensing mob heads onto them to make it look like blocks are zipping around after one another. Top that. <laughs> wait, 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 what? are you and what are you doing he later adds a llama so that players can scoot along the curb themselves after this contribution to the district though iskel and mumbo are challenged to take away one of its foundational features one of grian's challenge chickens wants them to replace the diamond throne with mycelium they do the deed whether in the name of the resistance or not and mumbo is left holding the commercial district's entire diamond supply what could possibly go wrong okay if i genuinely lose them I'm really, really scared that I'm gonna lose them! Okay. Rather than keep them in his ender chest though, Mumbo decides the safest place to store them would be in an underground vault in the shopping district, even keycarding the vault with the same item he used in a storage build for Good Times with Scar. Surely this is safe even from people who are currently building secret underground mycelium tunnels. I don't know why I'm increasing the security so much, because obviously the diamonds have just been sat in there for like the whole season, and obviously nobody's stolen them, but now, now I feel the need to keep them secure because I'm in charge of them. The keycard system also comes into play for his new commercial venture. Since the Odea store has had a very successful website but no actual customers, Mumbo plans to sell access passes to his industrial district, where his server mates can farm all the supplies they want in a single session. To make this a more attractive proposition, he adds a TNT-powered tree farm into the mix, although the sugarcane farm seems to have attracted quite the crowd already. Also managed to get a decent number of sugarcane-holding zombies. I mean, this, this is quite the army. 
And that's about it for this week's recap. Our writer is Loy XP, and my name is Pixel Riffs. If you want to see our writer betray everyone he's ever loved, watch Loy's debut in Among Us, linked in this week's end screen theatre. Don't forget to leave a like while you're still here, and subscribe so you won't miss future recaps. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.